first of all, let me thank you for the invitation. It is an honor and a privilege to be with you. I think all of us would have liked or preferred another kind of meeting than the virtual one, but this is nice too. So <clears throat> our talk is entitled Different Arenas, Different Texts, One Message? Question mark. What can we learn from a combined analysis of manifestos and parliamentary debates? This is something which is not foreign to Paula Clarine, as I saw from the papers in session three on Laura Morales and Constanza Navarreta and daughter Hansen. They are also dealing with the relationship between manifestos and texts. So, <clears throat> what we basically want to tell you is we have substantively two sources but one message. We have two sources but two thunderous insights, one of a methodological nature, uh, <clears throat> of which we obviously will also hear more in session three, and regarding the process of political representation. The manifesto project <clears throat> um, exists since quite a while. 1979, it was founded by, <coughs> Jan, uh, by Ian Butch, and 1989, very briefly, it was uh, then headed by hans Peter Klingemann at the Science Center, where it is still today, but since 2009, it is on, uh, on, on long-term funding by the German Science Foundation. What do we have? There is a traditional part of the project, the main data set, which consists of manual coding of manifestos, human coding using 56 core categories. We have 1,200, roughly 1,200 uh, parties in over 60 countries, more than 700 elections since 1945, covered to today, roughly 4,600 manifestos. So that is a lot of stuff, but it's not the only stuff we have. The second <clears throat> part of the manifesto project is the corpus. That is a real innovation. Also, uh, yeah, given the long time frame of the project, quite new. Uh, it was introduced basically in 2009 to do uh, the digital text collection of manifestos providing a machine readable in a form which is, as far as we can do it, uh, digitally annotated, which means uh, the link between the end human coded manifestos and the text. And <clears throat> we have done that for roughly 1,300 documents. Machine readable, we, we have more than 2,000. Uh, we have it in 35 languages, which is a challenge. And the first release of the Manifesto Corpus was in 2015. We are working on that since then and making good use of that. But that's not all. It's not only that we have that, but we also provide it. So there we have a web page where we have easy access and usability of the data. We have an R package. Manifesto R, we have tutorials there, and maybe that is a teaser for Paula Clarine. We will have English translations of core languages of parts of the corpus available soon. Now I'm quitting, and Paula is taking over with an example on automated content analysis of manifestos and speeches. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I will take over now and give some insights from an analysis that I conducted and in which I used both manifestos and plenary speeches to study political representation. So, back to these two sources. First, to manifestos. Manifestos are written before an election. Parties use them to make policy offers to prospective voters. They give guidance to parliamentarians once in office and they inform competing parties 
about a party's um, policy preferences. Voters, on the other hand, expect parties to follow these programs when elected into parliament. And then in this parliamentary arena, speeches are expressions for the discussion and bargaining processes in parliament. Parties use them to state their policy positions in front of their fellow parliamentarians, but they also use them to inform their voters about their actions in parliament, often mediated through the media. In the process of representation, manifestos and speeches are thus marking two important stages. Manifestos are promised to the voters about how the parties will represent them in parliament. And if the voters give their vote to a party and with that give the mandate um, to represent them in parliament, they expect them to act in line with their programs. So following this mandate idea, the positions stated um, in the manifesto should be expressed in the speeches. However, parliament is also an arena of discussions and bargaining processes. And this only makes sense if there is also room for maneuver and thus a possibility for position change. Expecting parties not to change their positions at all seems naive in this context. Um, so the important question is how stark this position change is and whether it can be justified in the representation process. So the question I'm asking is how well this delegation mechanism between the electoral arena and the parliamentary arena works and where and why it might come to, to deviances between party positions in the two arenas. And the case I selected um, to study this delegation process is Germany. Um, Germany is a good case for this analysis because of its strong parties. This makes it easier to treat the parties as unitary actors. And for the time frame I analyzed, um, it also had a very stable party system. There are a total of five parties um, that have been in parliament over this whole time frame. What also needs to be considered is that by selecting Germany, I've chosen a proportional um, system, thus the results have to be interpreted in the context of such a proportional system. The time frame I'm analyzing is 1990 to 2013, um, and this yields a um, tax corpus consisting of 35 manifestos from seven elections and over 300,000 speeches from six legislative terms. With such a large amount of text manual coding as we do it in the manifesto project is of course not possible anymore. So instead I've been relying on automated approaches. And to conduct such an automated analysis um, of these different text types does create some challenges because even though manifestos and speeches share similarities, they are also very different in other regards. On the one hand, manifestos and speeches have similar audiences. They are both directed to voters, the party base, and other parties. And parties use them to communicate their policy preferences. But on the other hand, they are very different text types. One is written text, the other spoken words, even if often based on a written manuscript. Because of this different text nature, the language used in both documents differs to a great extent. In speeches, more filler words occur, and there might be more colloquial language or sarcasm. In manifestos, parties generally use a more objective tone and they write them in a more condensed way. So these differences clearly need to be considered when analyzing these documents in a combined analysis. And the solution I followed here was basically a very rigorous text pre-cleaning. What I was doing was that I was extracting each sentence's main message by reducing it to just the main words and bigrams with the help of a part of speech tagger. Um, so um, the analysis, sorry, um, I conducted uh, starting a two-step process. In the first step, um, I used supervised learning methods to classify both speeches and manifesto sections into different policy domains. Um, as training data, I was using the speeches by ministers and parliamentary state secretaries um, and was thus creating policy domains along the ministerial portfolios. This way, I could classify the text into up to 16 different policy domains per legislative term. Um, and then in the second step, I used um, these policy domain specific text clusters to define party positions in both the electoral arena and the parliamentary arena using the WordFish algorithm from Proxion Slayton. I calculated separate positions for the electoral arena based on the manifesto content and for each legislative year based on the plenary speeches of that year. 
and thus determine party positions in those two arenas with regard to the different policy domains I developed in the first step. The result is a new data set of party positions in those two arenas. However, before conducting any analysis with this new data, it is of course important to test for the quality of the data. And um, as I said before, um, the fact that we have very different text types um, of these two documents creates some methodological challenges, um, which makes it very important to carefully check for the validity of the results. And I've run a variety of different validity checks. I cannot go into detail um, about all of them here. Um, what I would like to do, though, is to stress two tests I've conducted to test for correlative validity. And for these tests, I've made use of the fact that for the manifestos, um, the manifesto corpus provides information about policy content of specific text sections from the manual code inquiry conducted. So for all documents um, that have been digitally coded um, in the project, we provide the orig original text together with the annotations assigned um, to the quasi sentences by our expert code. And using this information, I could first test how well the algorithm trained on speeches travel to manifestos by comparing the classification results with the manually assigned codes. Um, the results were very promising. To give an example, 80% of manifesto sections, which the algorithm coded as being about development policies, had been coded by the manifesto expert coders into the category internationalism, internationalism positive. Um, and in another test, I compared the predicted policy positions with indices calculated um, from the manifesto project codings. Um, here, the correlation between the new um, policy domain specific positions and these indices lay on average at 0.7. So after these validity tests, we can now dive into the substantial analysis of the data and study party position change before and after election. Um, today, I will highlight two of the findings I could gain from the data. So the first finding is that party positions converge in the parliamentary arena compared to the electoral arena. And a uh, comparison of polarization measures in the two arenas has shown that the level of polarization is nearly always smaller in the parliamentary arena compared to the electoral arena. As an illustrative example, you can see here a graph that shows um, the party positions on the environment during the 16th legislative term. This finding emphasizes the different logics of party competition at play in the two arenas. In proportional systems, without one party holding a majority, Parliament is the arena where parties need to make compromises. To come to a final decision, they need to form government coalitions, but they also need to come to agreement with other veto players. This leads to converging positions. In the electoral arena, on the other hand, the fact that multiple parties are competing for votes requires the parties to diverge their positions more strongly, to give the voters an incentive to vote for them and not another party. An important aspect with regard to these findings is that convergence does not only take place for the parties in a government coalition, but for all parties. This suggests that the need for compromise goes beyond the necessities connected to being in a government coalition. However, this should not be misinterpreted as a sign that political role does not matter. It does make a difference whether a party is in a government coalition or not. Not all parties converge their positions to the same extent. Congressional analysis predicting the size of the distance change between two parties clearly shows this difference. Coalition partners decrease the distance between each other more strongly than parties not in a coalition. So while there seems to be an incentive for opposition parties to slightly change their positions in parliament to ease dialogue with the other parties, these incentives are not as strong as they are for government parties. So finally, what are the takeaway messages from the study? Let me conclude with both some methodological as well as some substantive insights we can gain from such a combined analysis. To the methodological side, first of all, this analysis um, shows that a combined analysis of manifestos and speeches is possible if carefully conducted. And second, in order to test how well such an analysis has worked out, the manually assigned codes from the manifesto project can, can serve for conducting correlative validity checks. With regard to the substantial side, 
the analysis has shown that it is important to differentiate between party positions in the electoral arena and the parliamentary arena, because drawing inferences on political representation by just looking at party positions from the electoral arena, we would overlook important changes taking place in parliament. And such a differentiated analysis also shows, allows to further inspect reasons for such position changes. Position change is not random, but the result of co-governance and the need for compromise in this process. So these results are relevant for extending content and analytical research, and they open up new research possibilities for democracy research and theory. So, thank you, and we look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much. I see no questions and comments in the chat. Uh, one. Does anyone perhaps prefer to ask a question? Daria, there is a question from uh, Andreas Plette. So Andreas, you can uh, uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, so hi to Bernhard and uh, Paula. Uh, I think it's it's really great that uh, the two communities meet here. The uh, Manifesto uh, Research Group uh, is so strong and established, and my daughter wants to join in. I just I just get her. Sorry. Uh, so sh she's too curious. Yeah sitting behind the computer. No, I think it's really a great opportunity that these two communities meet uh, here on this occasion. Uh, and uh, in a way, it has been overdue to, uh, br uh, to bring about a dialogue between uh, the group of people in the Pala Clarine community who mostly have a different background than the political science, but who are interested in the uh, in parliamentary speeches and you as kind of, kind of hardcore traditional other political scientists. Now, I think one of the fundamental questions we should address is whether you can really compare manifestos and parliamentary speech. Um, and you were careful to uh, not, not to rush into the comparability, uh, but maybe we should think twice because um, it's different genres. So the texts work differently. Uh, and I would, or my experience with work and working with parliamentary data is that you have lots of dialogue. So people or your different uh, parliamentary groups pick up the speech of others, contradict it and introduce their own position. Doesn't that, uh, isn't that at odds with uh, some of the fundamental assumptions about how manifestos work, uh, those that are uh, derived from science theory, for instance? Um, and I just picked that book from my bookshelf, Slappin and Proctor. Of, of course, they are the pioneers for the word, Wordfish methods. But in their, I think, 2015 book uh, about the politics of parliamentary debate, the point of departure is actually that when working with parliamentary data, they found it so different. Uh, and maybe we should, I, I think it's, for me, it was too fast to bring in just one line diagram where you have manifesto in 2005, then the straight line to the next year's party position, and then going back to the, it might be an artifact. Uh, and I, I'm sure you've thought about it. Maybe you can sh share some further ideas and more than you could say in a short presentation. Um, yeah, thank you very much um, for this uh, question. And um, of course, uh, you picked on uh, some of the um, biggest challenges uh, we have um, when doing such kind of analysis. Um, I still think that, yeah, there is a lot in there that's very interesting substantially, and that's why I think um, should definitely uh, try um, working on this. Um, and of course, um, as you rightly pointed out, there are many differences in this kind of text. So for example, the saliency approach obviously doesn't work in parliamentary speeches because the procedures basically or the agenda um, defines what topics are being talked about so there aren't that many differences between the parties um, with regard to what they talk about um, which is why then i decide okay i have to look into what are the positions they take on these different issues but i um yeah can't just work with um the science idea that we use um in the manifesto project and I also see that um, there are problems with the Wordfish um, model and that it's, um, yeah, it's picking up some latent scale and it's 
very important to carefully look into um, what's going on there. As I said, I, I try to run different validity checks and try to then also on the manifesto side at least, as like basically the speeches were always my starting point, um, and then I used um, what I generated there to also classify the manifestos um, and then test it again what I found for the manifestos with the data that we had from the manifesto project. So that gave me some um, conviction that, that I'm picking up something um, that's really there. Um, but um, yeah, I definitely think we're still kind of at the starting point here and um, there's still much research needed um, to further look into these um, aspects and yeah, get more, gain more knowledge on that. Thank you, Paula. In the meanwhile, we have received another question from Paul Rayson. So um, I can read this, this loud, uh, or Paul, you can unmute yourself or ask it yourself if, if you uh, can do it fast. Yeah, thanks. I was just worrying, uh, wondering whether you can kind of bridge this comparability divide by triangulating against speeches either during the election period or speeches outside of parliament and that might let you you know do that three-way comparison uh, not across the written spoken boundary yeah thank you that's uh, actually a um, very good idea i think i've also been thinking a little bit about uh, that's um also a different kind of than who's um articulating in speeches and it's probably more the party leaders and um, which on the one hand would also make sense because that's probably more what voters pick up from the parties and what's um, been said in the media um, by um, important um, people from the party base and not always um, the the manifesto content um, and yes you're right that would probably make it um, easier with regard to the text type so um, that would definitely be something interesting to look into. Okay, thanks. Yeah, maybe it's more difficult to collect those multiple yeah. speeches and you know from many different sources. And it's then also a question of like what you pick. Like probably you won't get everything, and then yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where where okay. you make the selection. All right. Thanks. Mm 